Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the second meeting of the Young Women Lead Committee. This is a, a very unique committee that the Parliament is supporting in partnership with Young Women Lead, which is a leadership project that 38 young women right across Scotland are taking part in. Some are around the table today and others are with us in the public gallery at the back. Today's session will run until approximately 12.25 and may I welcome those who are watching online and thank you very much for the interest you're showing in our work. The committee met in February and agreed a topic of inquiry and that was to look at the issue of sexual harassment in particular as it is faced by girls and young women in school. After the meeting, uh, the committee members undertook engagement in their communities around the country to hear the voices and experiences of young women in school. At today's meeting, we'll be hearing the results of that work, and I am very pleased to welcome our first panel, who will tell us about the online survey which they undertook. And that's Katrina Carter and Alexandra Stevens, uh, and I would invite you to make some opening remarks of up to 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much. Um, so overall, our survey um, received some really, really good, thoughtful responses, um, and it was full of lots of really well-structured uh, comments as well. It confirmed a lot of the ideas that we discussed in the last committee, and it also brought forward a few new ideas which we hadn't thought of ourselves. Um, so an overview of the responses that we had. For the pupils survey, we had 104 responses, and for the staff survey, we had 63 responses. Um, so in terms of the demographics of the survey that we had, one of the big focuses of this survey was to get responses from people who were living in rural areas, um, and that, that worked really, really well. We got 47% of our responses from rural areas, which we were really happy about. Um, in terms of the rest, the demographics that we had a breakdown of, um, we had 62 people who said that they identified as being white Scottish. 61% um, of our responses said that they, see, they saw themselves as being straight. 16% um, saw themselves as being bisexual. And 7% um, saw themselves as being lesbians. In terms of the staff demographics that we had, we had, again, um, quite a decent rural response. It was 29% viewed themselves as coming from uh, rural areas. 65% um, uh, saw themselves as being quite Scottish and 81% um, viewed themselves as straight. Um, in terms of the overall kind of summary that we had of responses, it was broken down into the, the four themes that we discussed in the last committee section. Um, so some of our survey responses, um, moving on into theme one, um, they viewed that the behaviour of the groups, which were most commonly seen to be harassers, was often explained away as being part of lad culture. Um, so the most common age group that were viewed as being um, the sexual harassers were boys aged between 11 and 15. Um, and this was often seen as being a product of societal norms and the fact that it was almost expected that boys of that age um, behaved in that way. Uh, the largest reason given for this behaviour was a lack of education on their behalf, which is something that we're going to touch on a little bit later. Um, and again, that's seen as being a product of an education system which does not equip its staff or pupils adequately to confront this behaviour. So these were responses that we were given in the first kind of section of the survey. And, and these were the consistent themes that really that kept coming up. Um, as a result, uh, what, what we saw to be happening was the cycle continuing of behaviour going unchallenged and unpunished, um, and then it just becomes expected and normalised. Um, yeah, so uh, we also found that pupils felt quite strongly that they didn't feel comfortable discussing sexual harassment with staff. Um, on the other hand, staff felt very comfortable discussing instances of sexual harassment with pupils. Um, so actually 63% of pupils said they would not feel comfortable discussing an instance of sexual harassment with staff, whereas 77% of staff said they would feel comfortable discussing an instance of sexual harassment with pupils, which we found was quite a big disconnect. Um, so whilst this might be symptomatic of the age of pupils, um, around 14 to 15, um, so people just not, uh, pupils just not wanting to admit that they were willing to discuss sexual harassment with a teacher, um, we also thought it indicated 
that we needed more inclusive discussions around difficult topics. Um, staff are capable, they feel very capable of handling these kinds of conversations um, and, and we definitely need to work on healing that disconnect. Um, so when questioned on the content of the current sex education curriculum, pupils were a lot more critical of it than teachers. Uh, pupils largely felt the curriculum did not cover issues as inclusively or robustly as they should be. Um, teachers, they didn't respond so negatively about it, but were under no illusion that the majority of teenagers got their information online or from friends. Um, and so the areas that they felt, but both groups felt, the curriculum needs improving include issues surrounding consent and respect in relationships. Um, so that's an area which, which we saw um, to have a strong link into the misogynistic and problematic behaviour that's manifesting in the young men that we're talking about just now. So we also found that um, overall teenagers were quite savvy when identifying instances of sexual harassment. So about 70% of them ident identified instances correctly, um, even in its more well-disguised forms. Um, teachers were good at identifying instances of sexual harassment themselves, um, but they didn't give pupils as much credit as they deserved um, when identifying um, instances of sexual harassment. Um, so 40% of staff thought that pupils would misidentify instances of sexual harassment. Um, which indicates that perhaps discussions around sex education might be too simplistic and we should focus more on nuanced issues surrounding relationships rather than just the bare bones of safe sex. Um, as young people are entering an, into relationships at a much younger age um, than the curriculum facilitates for, it's essentially failing because it's not designed to be appropriate or relevant for its audience. Um, so in terms of next steps, which was probably the largest focus um, part of the survey, we got a lot of qualitative answers for this section of the survey and there was a lot of really, really good ideas. Some of those were brought forward in our last committee session, but there was also some new responses that, um, that we found really, really interesting. Um, so in terms of next steps, what pupils really wanted to see was to have a trained named contact in school with whom they could go to about issues. So 90% of the pupils that we spoke to said that that was something that would really, really help them. Um, they wanted this person to be someone who was specifically trained um, and specifically equipped to give advice. So not even necessarily to give advice on the prosecution or on the reprimand of the offenders themselves, but just advice in terms of how they go about dealing with these instances and how to negotiate them in a school setting. Um, and from staff, there was an 84% response rate of support for this as well. Um, and what, they, what staff interestingly said about this was that what they want to see more of was um, not necessarily an individual contact, but just lots of different contacts within school um, that could be trained in these issues so pupils had more than one place to go to. So it wasn't just a case of having one person. Um, it was a case of having lots and lots of different people in school that, pe that pupils could go to with this. Um, interestingly enough, another, another few responses often said that this wasn't the place of teachers and that they want a, a, a specific trained person to come in from the outside. Um, so that's obviously an area for discussion moving forward, but that was something that I that we certainly found to be quite interesting. Um, and there was also a great deal of support for there to be a safe space in school. Um, so staff supported this idea a lot more than pupils necessarily did. So 94% of staff were in support of this being something to be brought into school or at least trialled. Um, of course, there was a call that the entire school environment should be a safe space. However, um, obviously having a, a specially set out safe environment for, for girls or for those wanting to go into um, is something that was viewed as being really, really important. Um, there was an, also an overwhelming sense from staff that they didn't receive the training or support that they need to discuss these issues effectively with their young people. So staff, there, from staff, there was a, a lot of focus about wanting policy or legal advice um, to, to discuss these issues because they don't know where they stand in terms of what advice they can give. Um, and that was, that was certainly their call. A few people noticed wanting specific policy changes, um, but it was more staff who kind of wanted to know their rights and their grounds for which they can give advice and exactly how they can support. 
Um, so these, this was echoed by pupils, um, and again, they wanted to know their rights more in terms of how they report incidents and who these reports would go to. Um, so a lot of pupils voice that they didn't just want their parents to be notified right away. That was something that was quite a big concern to them. They wanted to know that their reports would be made in a confidential environment. Um, so staff also cited the importance of education being cross-curricular and having a way to engage pupils with it. Um, so things that they suggested were workshops and community or parental involvement. Um, so I think what they, what they really meant by it being cross-curricular is they didn't want it just to be focused on sex education, but it wants to be something that was across the entire curriculum so it wasn't undermined in our other areas of the school. Um, so that kind of links into the whole school approach that we were discussing in the last committee session as well. Um, so overall, the key themes that emerged were that there needs to be an overall there needs to be an overhaul of the whole education system for pupils and specifically for the training of staff um, with a focus on it being inclusive, relevant and robust um, to, invest, to instigate an attitude change and cultural shift within the education sector. Um, in order for this to be effective, staff need to be supported with the appropriate policies and models to ensure that they can provide solid advice and education to their pupils. Thank you very much. That, that was extremely interesting to me, I, I have to say. I'm sure it was to everyone else. Um, I'm sure there are many questions, so if you indicate to us, we will try and accommodate you, Mina. Um, I'd like to ask the witnesses um, if they're... Um, about what the incidences of sexual harassment as relating to race, gender and sexuality... Um, in within your um, within the online survey. Okay, um, so we actually found uh, surprisingly that there wasn't a huge amount um, where people felt that it was relating to sexuality. I'll touch on the other issues in a second. So, fifty six fifty six percent of pupil responses believed that sexual harassment was most commonly targeted at heterosexual people. Um, twenty five percent believed that it was targeted at homosexual people, um, and only three percent um, at bisexual. Other respondents indicated that there was often no preference, or that sexuality was sometimes unknown. Um, and in terms of it being related to, to transgender individuals, there, there again wasn't a huge amount of um, data about that. It was only around 1% or 2% um, that identified that as being an issue. Um, it was, so again, it was indicated as being uncommon for sexual harassment to have a same-sex element. So 59% of respondents disagreed with this being, as being an important factor. Um, and in terms of there being a racial element, there was a slightly larger response to that. Um, so 34% of responses thought that this appeared to contribute. Um, and in terms of, of staff and um, what they felt about this, 50% um, of those responses said it was directed at heterosexual individuals, 28% of them believed it was targeted at homosexuals, um, but again, they often indicated that sexuality was unknown or not believed to be a factor. Um, and staff deemed it to be fairly common for harassment to be directed at individuals of the same sex, so 29% um, believed that, and 36 felt that this was not a key factor, so that was an overall summary of what we found. Um, and again, it was a similar kind of response in terms of there being a racial element. So 33% of staff deemed there to be a racial element in harassment, but 36 believed that this not 36 percent sorry believed this not to be a key factor. Hannah, <laughs> you mentioned that 63% of pupils were unhappy to speak to staff about these issues. Did they give any kind of specific or overriding reasons as to why this was the case? Um, so the way that the survey was worded, um, it was more that they just felt uncomfortable. Um, so they felt, so people felt uncomfortable speaking to a member of staff about a sexual or intimacy issue. Um, so, and 63% also said that they weren't confident in staff's ability to answer. So it was sort of a, a com a comfort and a confidence thing that I was that we've sort of found being the most prolific factors there. Alexandra, uh, we did identify that as an area where there could be further research. So, Lisa, you mentioned that 
that um, pupils weren't too enthusiastic about the idea of a safe space <coughs> to um, go when you're experiencing any of these issues. Did you get any indication of what that might be, if there was any kind of stigma around that idea? Um, so certainly, where pupils voiced a want for a safe space, they were very, very keen for it. But I think where pupils were really most focused on was getting a named contact in school. Um, so that may well tie into being connected to have a safe space in terms of this person also kind of representing a safe space to go to discuss that. So it might have been a kind of a miscommunication on our behalf. We may not have kind of articulated it well enough to say a safe physical, for example, a room to go into rather than just kind of like a metaphorical safe space. Um, so, so that was kind of the response that we had, whereas staff in particular kind of viewed this more as kind of like a lunchtime group or something. So it was so it's kind of perhaps a miscommunication there in terms of what it actually meant. Uh, is it on this particular point, you know? No. <laughs> I'll come back to you, Zoe. <laughs> so moving forward, if we were going to make recommendations at the next meeting from your findings, what would be the key elements we want to cover in a training session that we could offer to staff that would touch on the key things we want uh, the students to be taking away? Okay. Um, so I think what was quite important was to kind of teaching staff and the ability to use inclusive language to kind of make lots of different groups feel comfortable to bring their um, to bring their issues and ideas forward. So again, it kind of links into the whole safe space in terms of pupils knowing that staff are able to discuss these issues in a way which is inclusive and safe and relevant. Um, so definitely use of language is something that came up um, and cer certainly, sort of, for, from a staff point of view, the focus was really on policy. So it was in terms of knowing exactly what rights they have within school to kind of help a pupil to what degree they feel they can give advice and also what advice they can give. So we got the impression that staff didn't necessarily know where the line was in terms of what they could report. Um, that would have to then be taken further and what could just be reported in terms of we can then give advice from this. So for staff it was definitely policy but for pupils it was more of from a use of inclusive language and just knowing that the staff have the knowledge to help them. Alexandra. Sorry, can I just add, um, there, w there, was, there seemed to be a general assumption among staff as well that um, pupils um, weren't, weren't as um, educated in uh, sexual relationships as as they actually are. Um, so for, for staff to be able to recognise that pupils are entering sexual relationships from a younger age um, and experiencing the nuances of, um, of sexual harassment, sexual relationships um, at a much younger age, then there might be more of an open discussion around it. As, as I said, you know, not just sticking to the bare bones of this is sexual health, this is what you need to do to protect yourself, etc. Yeah, follow up, Zoe. You talked about the value of looking at relationships, I guess, as opposed to specifically the sexual element of them. So do you have anything from the data that would be, do we have any key principles, I guess? Do we have any essential um, areas that where people are lacking knowledge that we can go and do further research into? Okay. Um, so I think it was more, the first kind of question we asked when we talked about that topic was how do you feel um, discussing relationships or intimacy with a partner? Um, and so in terms of that, it's more about discussing the emotional intelligence kind of relating to a relationship. Um, and so where, um, where pupils felt the current curriculum was strongest was in terms of discussing contraception. So that was kind of what we referred to as like the bare bones of sexual relationships. Um, but it is more kind of about respect and consent, et cetera. And that's kind of what um, we felt the education system should kind of focus on. I can fit in a quick question, Mina, if you still wish to ask it. <laughs> yeah. Um... I wanted to ask if there was any, um, if you found any sort of information on differences with um, um, young women and, and girls living in rural areas. Um, so, that, unfortunately, that wasn't something that kind of came through too strongly in the data. So, although we did have like a very good split 
Um, a few of the comments when we were looking at the data at the end of the survey, um, girls from rural areas certainly didn't feel they had the access to the resources that they need. That was certainly something that came up. Um, and again, it, there was just an overwhelming sense that the, that the education they were getting provided with and the resources that they had access to just weren't appropriate for, for what they needed. Um, but overwhelmingly, there was just a sense of that throughout all of the responses. So although it was, it's probably more problematic for those coming from a rural background in terms of the access and like the physical logistical access to that support, it was just something that kind of was consistent throughout all of the responses. Thank you. And I'm going to ask our deputy convener to do a quick summary of, of what we've heard. Um, I think it's clear that there's a, a will from school staff and young people to come up with positive and workable solutions to these problems. And thank you for giving your thoughts on them. Uh, thank you, Deputy Convener. And thank you very, very much to our panel. Uh, that, that, that was fascinating and a great start to today's meeting. Thank you. And uh, suspend briefly to allow that change of witnesses. Uh, welcome to our second panel this morning, who will be discussing the, the online campaign that they have been running over the last month. Welcome Eleanor Soper and Katie Williams. Please give us your introductory remarks. Thank you, convener. Uh, when we designed the social media campaign, we went in with the intention of highlighting uh, awareness of the survey and the focus groups that we would be running. And we also decided that it would be really important to have people share their personal stories, as we've seen on the back of things such as the Me Too campaign. This kind of personal sharing creates a really big impact and highlights you know, issues within our society. Um, so what we did initially was we set about and got personal testimonials from people within our own peer groups in order to make these into infographics. And we also took evidence from the first committee session um, and created those into infographics as well uh, in order to raise awareness of our campaign. And Katie's going to go in now and tell you about the things that we found. Thank you. Uh, by the 23rd of March, we finalised the campaign and the content that we were going to share. Overall, Twitter performed better uh, was the better performing platform as every post received interaction at some point with seven posts being shared over 10 times or more. Logo One was retweeted 40 times and shared on Facebook 17 times which says the, y the YWL committee needs you. It's time to expel violence against women and girls in school. Raise awareness and share your story using our hashtag that we created Scott School VAWG. The prominent accounts that shared it were North Lancashire Council, Orkney Rape Crisis, Mindwaves, Maureen Watt, MSP, Shetland Rape Crisis, East Ayrshire, Parent Network Scotland, Chloe White, MS, MSYP, and Dundee Council. Our second most popular received 40 retweets, and it was promoting focus groups within Scotland uh, that showed the times and places. The post said, join the conversation about sexual harassment in schools at one of our focus groups. The infographic um, that stated, sorry, the infographic that stated Girl Guiding's Girls Attitude Survey 2017 found that 24% of respondents felt unable to engage in sports school due to sexual harassment. That was shared on Twitter 14 times and was shared on Facebook four times. The prominent figures who interacted that with that was Kirsty Strickland, Rape and Sexual Assault Centre, Perth and Kinross, Fife and Rape Sexual Assault Centre, um, and also Kirkaldy. We used the hashtag in accordance to Trans Visibility Day to help promote our campaign, and that one was shared uh, 12 times on Twitter and gained a, gained a strong reaction 
from prominent individuals. Uh, that was including Shetland Rape Crisis, Volunteer Glasgow, Orkney Rape Crisis, RDU Gender Equality and Feminism Society, and John Bell and Christine McKelvey. Uh, 10 out of the 21 of the content that was included of the surveys and encouraging people to share their experience averaged around four uh, retweets on Twitter. As, uh, in terms of the responses, six of the stories that were shared on Twitter in comparison from two on Facebook, four came from the Young, uh, young Women's Leadership Committee. Uh, two members from outside the committee shared their own responses as well. Um, we discovered that although the tweets and Facebook posts were popular online, we were lacking um, people giving the responses directly to us. Therefore, we created a form where people can uh, share their experience anonymously by just putting a little experience um, or sharing their story on there. From that, we gained 11 responses, which we deemed successful. Um, one of them came... Oh, yeah, one of the uh, members from the RGU Feminist Society shared their story of feeling humiliated after being harassed at school. Should I say it? Yeah. Uh, they... They said, I personally experienced this throughout secondary school, both in Tanzania and in Britain. It was embarrassing and you personally felt ridiculed when they would go for you. You couldn't stop them because it was portrayed as funny and you just don't know how to take a joke. It got to the point where they would unhook my bra. How is that okay? Make it known that this is ridiculous and harassing. Her act is not funny and should never be accepted. Teach your children not to invade anyone's personal space and to certainly never subject any girl to this humili humiliating experience. Uh, change the way people perceive normalised acts of harassment. Um, there were more experience of girls feeling embarrassed or bullied than vi than sorry. There are more experiences of girls feeling embarrassed or bullied than actual sexual violence. Um, from our responses, we had six relating to sexual. Harassment. One said, I had to walk to the canteen to get my locker. Every time I passed a group of sixth year boys who somehow found my phone number, they would text me messages like, I can see your pants, you shouldn't be wearing a thong, I'd love to see more. One that relates to the feeling of humiliation came from another anonymous ascender. Uh, she said, when I was 14, a guy who fancied me made up a rumour that my boyfriend gave me oral sex at school. The Asian kids at school were all friends, so the rumour spread quickly. I was terrified of, older, of my older brother finding out. The rumour put a strain on my relationship and affected a lot of my friendships. A response through Twitter came from a woman who told her experience with se sexual harassment at school. She said that, I remember in primary school, a boys had shiny shoes. He only wanted to dance with girls who were wearing skirts at the disco. I remember an adult making jokes about how back in their days, boys tied mirrors to their shoes so they could see up the girl's skirt. Upskirting is not new. So through our social media campaign, um, it was seen and supported from a lot of other organisations that also used our hashtag and included others of their own. There are a range of accounts that showed continual support as they liked and shared many of our tweets and contained the hashtag ScotSchoolVAWG. Ones that we would like to give a mention to are to the Orkney Rape Crisis, Engender, Shetland Rape Crisis, White Ribbon Scotland and Glasgow's Women Library. MSPs and councillors including Kim Long, Christine McKelvey, Maureen Watt and John Bell also showed uh, support and shared our tweets. Um, sorry. Yep. So we received uh, a tweet from PGRN Scotland who raised awareness on their own. We received a lot of retweets with some people um, who we had contacted prior to the launch of the social media campaign put out their own tweets in support of it. So PGRN Scotland tweeted that this is a great initiative to make the problem of VAWG visible in our society. Help young women Scot to raise awareness by sharing your story of VAWG in schools so we can all address this together. Orkney Rape Crisis were also um, very heavily involved in this and used the hashtag on multiple occasions. Uh, one tweet sharing that gender-based violence is happening in Scottish schools and young women Scot want to hear the experiences of both staff and pupils. 
We also had two other prominent tweets which featured the focus groups in Orkney, which were really important as we were keen to make sure that we were hearing from those in rural areas. Um, prior to the launch of the campaign, uh, we contacted all of the local authorities in Scotland as well as um, every elected official, um, as well as charities that dealt with young people and uh, you know, feminist issues, sexual harassment issues. Um, so companies such as North Lanarkshire Council, Shetland Rape Crisis, Zero Tolerance, the RGU Feminist and Equality Society and Children in Scotland also tweeted their own posts to help promote the survey and to get people involved in our campaign. We also um, sent out a press release and there were articles written about the campaign in Hollywood Magazine, Glasgow Live, Third Force News and Common Space. Uh, the co w these articles were shared with by people such as James Dornan, MSP, and Ian Welsh, OBE. Um, these reached quite a wide audience, which was especially helped by being featured in Engender's Friday Feminist 5 publication that goes out every week. So we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Yes, who would like to kick us off? I think you've stunned everyone with all this. Yes, Zoe. So based on the lessons you've learned in the social media campaign, if we were going to do research for recommendations on a sex ed update, um, what, would, what would be the lessons learned that you'd want to apply? What are the key mediums that we would focus if we had some funding? Elena? So obviously, like Katie said, the most uh, responded one, uh, the best platform that we used was Twitter. It received the most interactions, the most storytelling, uh, the most visibility. So I think we would probably highlight a lot more on Twitter with that. We did use um, promotion on both Twitter and Facebook, so we spent some money promoting those to make sure that they were appearing on people's feeds. I think the most successful part of the campaign was the fact that people were taken to the survey, and I think that was really important in making sure that we were getting that really good data from this, where story sharing obviously serves a great purpose in highlighting just why this issue is so important. Getting those recommendations um, from the survey was something that we felt really strongly that we needed to make sure was happening. Oh, Hannah, then Lisa. Um, I, this may not be data that you have, but um, in terms of the organisations that kind of promoted and shared the campaign, did you find that there was a kind of geographical pattern? Was it more rural or more urban areas? Were there any kind of regions that were particularly engaged with it? Um, so... <laughs> we had the most interaction from kind of urban-based charities. Obviously, these are charities such as Gender, Zero Tolerance, who do have outreach programs that go into rural areas. We didn't have as much engagement as I guess we would have liked from rural companies, but this may just be, you know, obviously, they're quite much smaller companies, so it can be more difficult to do that. Um, we did, however, have postings on some of the local authority websites, which was really useful, and a few high schools also shared... Um, our posts on Facebook and Twitter, uh, some which were in quite rural areas. I don't have the exact location now, but we did have some interaction from that. And hopefully, given that 47% of the respondents of the survey, we did somehow reach those people. It's probably something for next time to outreach, to reach out to more rural companies and uh, to more rural towns throughout Scotland. Lisa. Do either of you have a kind of personal view on why engagement through Facebook didn't um, do as well as through Twitter? Um, I do. So I believe, <laughs> <laughs> I believe that it's something like the um, average age of a Facebook user is actually now in their 40s. And this is just due to the fact that when Facebook started, it was young people that used it. And now a lot of this, so my partner's nephews are 14 and they don't have Facebook. So I think, unfortunately, while we were reaching out to a lot of staff and a lot of parents, there weren't as, as many young people engaged on Facebook, at, which is just a state of how social media is today. Um, so we just weren't reaching those people. We did um, also have quite a lot of interaction on Instagram. However, the, unfortunately, the way that Instagram works, we were unable to post links. So while we had the hashtag and we used all the infographics on Instagram, they weren't able to click on any links that would take them to the survey, but we do know, and we had quite a large spectrum of likes on Instagram, we do know that it was reaching young people. Just where they went from there, we've not, we weren't able to track just because of the way that that platform works. Mm. 
I, I'm sitting here just fascinated by all of this, you know, um, because I, I wouldn't have a clue. I post things on social media, and if one person likes it, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I understand that there's something called reach that my staff tell me about, that if you get maybe 100 sh shares, likes, or whatever, that the reach of that can be quite phenomenal. Is, is that something you were able to track in any way? The, um, the posts that were getting retweeted the most, um, I found once you got maybe over about six, then you had about an hour of it just booming. And uh, I was right. getting notifications. If I had posted it with the hashtag, I think on one of mine I got 14 retweets from one of my posts. Um, but it was, it was just within one hour, one person would share it, and if they had a huge, bigger following, mm -hmm. it would expand. Um, but I think you have a time scale with these posts. Right. Um, whereas something on Instagram, because of the way that the algorithms work, even if it's posted a few hours or a day before, it will still come up on your timeline. Whereas Twitter, it doesn't really. Um, so with, I think with tweets, you've got to make sure you're posting within the same, within this, um, within a certain time to make sure that you get the reach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll digest some of that. Thank you, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's all very straightforward to the rest of you. I just find it so amazing, actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mina. Um, related to the reach, um, I was wondering if you had statistics about the amount of people who've seen these posts, because I know at least on Facebook and I believe Twitter, you can see how many people have seen a post, clicked on a link, that sort of thing. We, we can give you that information in the report yeah. that we'll be producing, but we don't have the exact numbers of how many people have seen it. We, at the moment, we only have the numbers for retweets and likes, um, but that's certainly something that we'll be looking to get more into for the next committee meeting. Audrey. So in the interest of wanting to reach new, newer audiences and people who aren't already talking about it, were you able to go into the data and kind of qualitatively look at what proportion of the likes, responses, or just general activity was coming from people who weren't, hadn't explicitly stated on their profile or from their organization? that they were working in combating violence against women and girls? How many were new or didn't have hashtag feminist on their profiles, you know? Um, yeah. So for that one, obviously quite a lot of the engagement that we had was from people who were already interested in the issue. Um, the kind of most success I guess we have with reaching people that maybe weren't as involved was through the anonymous responses and obviously we don't have any way of tracking that but through the anonymous responses we got quite a lot of input from girls in the BME community um, which we were able to assess just through what they shared um, it was to do with their uh, ethnicity so it's something again that we'll be looking into further just to see you know were we reaching those people who aren't already engaged. Michelle. Is there anything that when it comes to the next stage of this process, you know, the reporting that you've learned from this experience that you would do differently with the social media to share the findings? Katie. Um, <laughs> um, probably just try and uh, get in contact, direct contact with other groups, um, with other organisations through social media, people who aren't um, hashtag feminist, <laughs> um, and just directly speak to them and say, would you be interested in learning about this and try and maybe help them, uh, encourage them to share our um, campaign as well? Yes, Zoe? Um, how much participation did we have from men? Um, based on, are you able to track that at all? Uh, so, we'll, a lot of the people that retweeted it were organisations. We actually had a, quite a large interaction from White Ribbon Scotland, who are a campaign of men fighting to end violence against women. Uh, so, they obviously have a really large following of of men, so we know, and they retweeted a number of our posts and talked about us on their feeds, so we know that we were able to reach 
a large male-dominated audience through them, which we're very grateful for. Um, but in terms of likes and retweets, again, that's something that we'll get into further when we produce the reports. I, I was quite interested in um, what you said about the age profile of Facebook users now as opposed to Twitter and Instagram and all these other things. And I wonder if, if Ava or Naomi or Iona had agreed with that? <laughs> or do you use Facebook? <laughs> Ava. We use Facebook to look at the group chats, such as the one we have for this and a couple other ones from school. But I, other than that, I don't look at the feed or the timelines or anything. Sure. I, I do. You I do. Like Twitter is good. And it's not as popular as platforms like Instagram and Snapchat, but it is really good and it is used by young people as well. Ah, Naomi. Um, I'd say I definitely use Instagram the most. But if I'm going to um, talk about a serious issue or look at stuff about a serious issue, I always go on Twitter. And I'm not on Facebook, really, at all, except for these to be in the group chat with this. <laughs> Hi, Una. I am a real Facebook user. I use it more than I use Twitter, but I don't use my social medias that much, so I don't <laughs> really know. But I am on it. <laughs> ah, that's interesting. OK, can I, can I ask our deputy convener to wrap up this session before we move on to the next one? Sure, it's been it's been great to hear about the the reach that you've had with young women across Scotland and you know the visibility that you've brought to this topic as it affects us specifically in Scotland. So thank you. And can may I thank you as well? And I'll suspend briefly to allow a change of witnesses. Welcome uh, to our third panel. Now, it's a large panel, um, so can I ask the panel that when questions are asked, you indicate to me which of you uh, you think is best placed to, to answer that particular question, and then others can perhaps come in in the back if they wish. Uh, welcome to Faria Saeed, Hayley Maxwell, Erin Wembo, and Emily Davis. I'm going to um, talk about about the focus groups, that'll be interesting, the focus groups that were held across the country. Can we have your presentation, please? Thank you, convener. Um, our aim was to collect information on reporting sexual harassment in schools. So we managed to conduct focus groups all across Scotland in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Fort William and Kirkwall in Orkney. We collected data from a diverse group of young people from both major cities and rural Scotland. The focus groups were smaller, which allowed for fuller discussions and a safe space for women to give their opinions. We gathered data from four different ethnic backgrounds, three different sexualities and one non-binary young person. Overall, we talked to 27 people. Um, the data was mostly from young school-aged uh, people, but there was also a number of young adults and one teacher. Lastly, participants said it was an enjoyable and informative, informative experience. Thank you. Um, so our focus groups were widely advertised on all social media platforms and Glasgow Live also shared an article inviting people to attend. Just to share some of our high level findings, 91% of all participants reported that sexual harassment or gender based bullying is a problem at school, but only 50% um, felt that there was a teacher they could trust to tell. Um, some appeared uh, concerned about creepy teachers and said that this was a barrier to reporting. 
70% of participants thought that ethnic minority girls experienced sexual harassment more or differently to white Scottish girls, and 62% of participants said the same thing for LGBT girls. 83% of participants said that um, girls are not to blame for sexual harassment or bullying in schools, and 100% said that at times the blame falls on girls when it shouldn't. So the majority of girls had a good understanding of sexual harassment before the definition was shared. The groups that took place in the south side of Glasgow were attended by mo mostly ethnic minority young women who reported links with racism and sexual harassment. The school aged girls said that many boys, they felt that many boys in their school were racist and that this was a contributory factor to the sexual harassment experienced by that group. It was also commented that negative stereotypes attached with black women um, portrayed through media imagery would perpetuate specific sexual assault and gender-based bullying for that group. The hijab-wearing women um, said that they perceived hijab pulling in schools as Islamophobic sexual harassment because it's essentially forcibly uncovering a girl against her will and without her consent. Um, it's important to mention that the ethnic minority girls said that just because they're not as open to talk about these issues um, due to stigma or culture or whatever else, it doesn't mean that they're any less engaged or involved with the topic. Um, yes, yeah, so I conducted the focus group in Fort William. It was attended by white Scottish young women of school age. Um, they did inform me that the group should have been larger. There were outside influences, why there were less uh, girls in attendance. Uh, the young women that did came, they were incredibly uh, excited about the experience and they were really engaged. Um, they expressed their the experience with sexual harassment was hard because of the population size of their school and the nature of the community. Um, and However, when they did attend, they wanted to learn more about sexual harassment as they no longer receive any form of sexual education uh, regarding this in school. They hadn't done so for two years and they're off to university in August and they didn't know what it was or how to say no or what it was to say no to. Um, they enjoyed the session and they said they felt it was important that their voice was being actively heard and that it was coming from a Scottish parliamentary point of view. Um, so the focus group that took place in um, the Orkney Islands took place in Kirkwall um, in the local youth cafe, which is a valuable community asset um, and a drop-in service for young people and we were really pleased to be able to include the voices of young people in a remote island setting. Um, it was mostly attended by white young women including one non-binary young person so it was interesting to be able to include the experiences of misogyny and gender-based violence um, from a young person who was perceived as female but didn't identify as such themselves. Um, the young people expressed worried, worries about reports of sexual harassment not being kept confidential by guidance staff, fear of being called a liar and feared exclusion or bullying from peers as a possible consequence of reporting in school. Um, young people all, were also concerned about um, education around the issue in school, that they felt that teachers themselves didn't understand consent or the law around consent. Young people expressed a desire for more opportunities to talk about sexual violence and gender at school and for more education on the topic. Young people felt that sexual harassment was linked to a broader culture of unrestrained on online and offline bullying, which led to young people not wanting to attend school and suffering decreased academic performance. Um, we had to strike a fine balance between collecting young people's views and being clear about confidentiality boundaries while not exposing ourselves to potential disclosures from young people. The issue of child protection meant that we felt we had to strictly limit the boundaries of our discussion. And so we used a platform called Menti, which allowed um, us to collect live and anonymous answers to some of the questions, as well as um, kind of compile it to be able to share the high level data with you. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you very much. I'm sure there's loads of questions. Um, oh, I was about to shout Audrey, but you were just fixing your hair. <laughs> Yes, Mina. To ask about the reasons that um, the outside reasons that you alluded to about why um, less people attended then than might have done otherwise. Um, based on the the nature of the area that we live in and uh, to protect the identity of the girls, I can't fully fully agree with that. <coughs> But 
sorry, I can add to that. Um, a lot of that was due to, so some of the feedback I got after was that they, all, despite all the, so I shared with them all the social media campaigns and they filled in the survey, they still didn't fully know what sexual harassment was. Um, and a lot of the girls they spoke to at school expressed that as well. And then when we went, so one of the things we did at the beginning of the focus group was we gave a definition of sexual harassment and we discussed it. And they all said, uh, we didn't know that's what it was. So I think if they didn't know what it was they were discussing about, they didn't know what the focus group, so that was a bit linked to it as well. Oh, that's interesting. Faria, you wanted to come in on that one? Uh, just also to add that the focus groups took place over the Easter holidays, so we weren't able to go into schools. Yep, Zoe's doing that eyebrow thing with me. Zoe. <laughs> it's, uh, I've talked a lot, Ibra, but um, I'm curious about the use of gatekeepers and getting access to girls. And so how did we um, use individuals in organizations in schools to have access to people? And um, if we did, how is that successful? And possibly for the future, what are some lessons learned if we were doing uh, these focus groups again for more targeted information? Uh, Haley. So... I, I, I am actually the prevention support and advocacy worker at Orkney Rape Crisis. Um, so I, I do um, education around consent and sexual violence with some of the schools in Orkney. So some of the young people were known to me um, and I have that kind of access already. And Faria, is, I don't know if you want to out yourself in where you work. So yeah, um, I work at Amman the Muslim Women's Resource Centre and um, we do have a schools project as well. But uh, it's, it's usually... There are there are certain challenges with getting into schools, and it's it's usually around timing. So, um, I think the the approach that we did go for worked pretty well. We tried to speak to youth groups, and then um, it was mostly just through social media. We managed to get um, an adequate number of girls together. Um, I'd say just it's good when you have a young person in the group who's in schools because they can speak to their friends and say, come along. There are challenges with it being school holidays and exam period and everyone's a little bit stressed and wanting to just get their exams out of the way. But um, I think it's good to keep in contact and good networks with young women who have, have friends in school and, and access to other young women through, through groups like this. Okay. Do you like to add anything, Emma? Um, yeah, that's how I got my contact with a young woman that I know. And she got, she's like, oh, I'm just starting to learn about feminism. I'd like to get involved. So that was her just entering the kind of sphere um, and wanting to learn more and really engage with it. Yeah. Yes, Hannah. Were there any common themes across the four different focus groups um, in terms of either solutions or the problems they faced? Because obviously it was quite a diverse range of places and people. So were there any kind of commonalities? Um, we did have a common theme around um, how comfortable girls were in speaking about it. And one in particular was how many girls would feel comfortable speaking to their parents about it. So um, every ethnic minority girl that um, participated said either not comfortable or slightly with encouragement from a friend. And the only girls that said that they would feel very comfortable speaking to their parents were white. So um, that's one of the themes that we had. And it's, I guess it's just around um, openness and talking about it um, by ethnicity. I don't know if anyone has anything to add. Yeah, just a few of the, so one of the great thing about Menti and the platform we use is they could submit um, answers in a multitude of ways. They could uh, answer, input their age or uh, say yes or no, and they could give um, their own written descriptions as well. Um, so one of the things was the definition. Um, so one, the question was, describe what you think sexual harassment was. Um, and the, the most used words, or the ones that came up them uh, often were unwanted, followed by inappropriate, and half the, and most of them noted that it was both verbal and physical. So they seemed to have either, whether it was before or during, they started to grasp um, what it was. And, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I can identify links with some of the um, responses we've been given by the other panels about sexual harassment linking to broader um, issues of, of bullying, um, racism, homophobia, um, and a, a lack of understanding across the board um, from school staff about how to address those issues, how to use inclusive language and to engage 
um, those groups of young people whose experiences of sexual harassment and bullying are actually intensified. Um, that kind of came out from, um, I think, all of our, our focus groups, that young people really had a desire um, that their understanding of these issues um, and experiences were matched by the responses of the adults that they knew were the people they could go to. Everyone did know what the, because we asked um, what the procedure was for reporting sexual harassment. They all said we would go to our guidance teacher who would then potentially take it on to the police. So they understood the process, but their confidence um, in the process was a bit varied um, and it did link to these kind of other issues. Just before I move on to Faria here, you said something, Hayley, during the presentation that bothered me, which was that there wasn't always a confidence that would be kept confidential? Yes. Um, I think possibly because I, I, I potentially in um, Fort William the issue might have been similar, that um, in a small rural community there's a perception that people's lives are very transparent. Whether that is true or not, um, whether there mm -hmm. had been an instance of a member of staff not keeping um, a kind of appropriate boundaries of confidentiality um, or other young people finding out um, whether or not that, that was something that would happen. It's a very real fear um, and mm -hmm. issues of community exclusion um, or ostracisation were something that I think really affected people's engagement with um, the focus groups, um, being seen to participate in them and to, to share their views. Um, again, whether the perceived punishment was real or not, um, it was certainly something that they, they did worry about. I, I maybe picked up wrong what you said before I'd gone to Erin and Faria again there. I thought what you'd actually meant was that young people were a bit loath to report to a guidance teacher. Yes, yes. So that For the same well. reason, yes. Same reason. Erin, and then Faria. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to jump in there because I've spoken to a lot of young women who, and young people in general, who don't want to go to guidance teachers because there have been cases where uh, cases haven't been kept confidential and also it's a case where you go to the guidance space and people see that and then they start going why did you go to guidance why did you go to guidance or or there's a big stigma around it and um, it just makes young people feel uncomfortable and not wanting to to report sexual harassment and bullying yeah funny also, just to mention that um, religion was quite an important factor. Um, the focus groups that took place in Glasgow were ma mainly attended by Muslim women who all said that they would never speak about this in the house. Sex is a taboo topic. There's fear of punishment and things like that. And also, quite differently from the results that Haley gathered, um, everyone in the Glasgow um, focus group said that they don't know how to report it. They didn't know how to report it in school. They would not feel comfortable reporting it. They, they, they just wouldn't know how to even go about it. Eva. Do you think that is because of the fear that the guidance counsellor would not keep it confidential and it would get back to their parents? Certainly from Glasgow, that was the concern, yes. Mm -hmm. And I suppose their peers, from what, what Erin said... It's a, a real concern. Yeah. Anyone want to come in on that? Because I could dominate this for ages. <laughs> yes, Hayley? One of the things that did come out um, that I mentioned was that um, people felt worried that they would, wouldn't be believed if they were to report, that the peers or um, staff that they reported to um, wouldn't believe them. Um, which is something that a lot of people who've experienced sexual violence, you know, do do experience um, this this fear of being disbelieved. It, it didn't really happen. It wasn't as bad as you're making it out to be. Um, so I think that that's the reason as well um, that people are kind of not very keen to report. Is, is there also an issue about ju people being judgmental? Is about is that is that a big deal in victim blaming? Yes, so we found um, the, the study showed that 100% of the respondents um, did feel that, that girls, bl blame was placed upon girls um, for experiencing sexual harassment. All of the young people thought that that was the case. That, that's, that's a really interesting response. Sorry. Wait, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> was there any discussion in the focus groups about shaming practices perpetrated by teachers or people in positions of authority. So um, discussions about what people are wearing. Uh, my understanding is that in schools, uh, teachers will comment on like the tightness of shirts or the shortness of skirts. And I'm just curious. Um, we just didn't include that in the, in the questions. 
it wasn't really the, the nature. I, th I think we could have, when we were uh, all on the phone trying to discuss the questions, we had a really long list and we could have gone on mm. loads of areas. But I think what I, I hope is okay, we were trying to do the, the reporting and what it was and that, that's sticking to that kind of theme, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Yes, Audrey. Were there any kind of insightful suggestions or perhaps even wishes or desires expressed by the girls of what they would like to see, um, not just in terms of change, but introduced to cause the positive change? Hayley. <laughs> um, so one young person suggested the um, implementation of an, an anonymous kind of way to report um, instances of sexual harassment, so a box um, whereby pupils could kind of um, put in a, a piece of card with their um, name and their, the details of the incident, which would be checked by staff. Um, so that would take out this issue of having to be seen to go to the guidance space. Um, they felt like that might be a, a positive change. Um, again, we think that the young people really wanted more opportunities to talk um, about sexual harassment and sex sexual violence um, kind of across the board. I think everyone um, found that that came out of their focus group. Faria then, Emily then Erin. Um, more education in schools. That's what came about um, a lot from the Glasgow ones. Um, the girls that were currently at school and the girls that, had, that were in school not too long ago said that they didn't receive any education on um, even what sexual harassment is in, when they were at school. The, the question, so we asked that question um, in the group and the main, main words that came up so it was how could your school make it easier and just like the girls said all, quite a few of the girls mentioned stuff like that keywords like that and it was um, a few of them said including both uh, include, doing it in a class environment with uh, male and females there so everyone's on the same page about it all but it's saying, it's saying again raising awareness and having the discussion with everyone not just in separate another thing um, that that we discussed was teachers challenging um, inappropriate language because there are a lot of cases where teachers turn a deaf ear to the inappropriate use of 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 many words surrounding sexual violence and sexual harassment and also um, learning about things like uh, feminism in schools and um, kind of having a forum to to have a case where you're not told what something is but just let your mind run mind run and that's something else we had a conversation about um, expanding your knowledge and lots of different things and interlinking it with sexual harassment and violence there was a desire for outside agency, agencies to come into schools to deliver um, training not just from rape crisis scotland but um <laughs> Um, LGBT youth in Stonewall, um, one young person uh, was really keen that um, agencies that had expert knowledge and training on issues around gender and sexuality um, and perhaps again for like religious and cultural issues um, to have organisations come in um, to speak to young people. In the first panel there was um, again a wee bit of discussion about whether it was appropriate that the one person to report to should be a teacher, an employee of the school, or someone from an, an outside organisation, perhaps, but a named named person, to use that hackneyed phrase. Um, is that something that, that perhaps came through in some of the focus groups, too? No, um, uh, sorry, um, no it didn't really come no. through, but I just mm -hmm. think when you've got... Cause so half wooden in a rural area, you just have don't you don't have the staff capacity. It's quite an impractical thing. So I think it's good. Um, uh, I think when a few of them said at school, there's certain teachers you feel more comfortable with, um, um, and stuff. So there's there is certainly one teacher they would always go to to talk to. So I think it's only fair that, and also all teachers have the entire knowledge. It's not just one teacher, no, not one member of staff, or everyone just knows mm. everything. Everyone's got. A, a base knowledge, so if they don't feel comfortable with that member staff that's the opposite sex or whatever, they could go to anyone they feel comfortable with. Maybe I'd just... Um, just to highlight again how different the results were based on what city um, the focus group was in, um, from Glasgow, the named person did come up as a suggestion, and uh, particularly because from, from those focus groups it was reported that they didn't have anyone they felt comfortable speaking to. So um, yes, that was a suggestion there. Interesting. 
Any other questions? No? Oh, yes, Lisa, coming in at the, the last <laughs> moment. <laughs> I just wanted to ask Faria, um, you mentioned that a lot of the young women you spoke to um, reported racism from uh, boys in their school. Um, did they indicate at all how comfortable they would feel reporting racist behaviour? Was there any difference between the sexual harassment element or just the general <laughs> things they're having to deal with? Or? Um, one of them was my little sister, so um, just personally, I, I do know about some of the incidents that happen in their school, and her and her group of friends are quite comfortable to report um, racist behaviour. Um, I'm not sure about anyone out with that circle, but um, we didn't, to be honest, we didn't really talk too much about general racism. It, we mo it was more just the way that it can... Um, sort of perpetuate specific sexual harassment for ethnic minority girls. Hayley. Could I ask a question about um, how the, about the young people's perceptions of um, the intensified ex experience of sexual harassment from um, marginalised groups? So we asked, do you think that um, BME girls experience more sexual harassment? And a lot of the young people said yes, that they, they felt that that was the case. Um, but we also asked, do you feel that um, young women with a disability experience sexual harassment more than non-disabled um, young people, and they weren't sure. Um, so there was kind of gaps in understanding about, um, and with all oh, with LGBT young people also, the, the kind of view across the board was even from heterosexual young people that yes, LGBT um, young people do experience more sexual harassment, but disability was an area where there really wasn't an awful lot of um, understanding, um, and that, that could be for a number of reasons. Okay, I'm going to ask her. Did you wish to come in there, Hannah? You can <laughs> if you wish. No, no. No one else? Last chance. No, I'm going to ask our Deputy Convener to sum up that last session, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I think your investigation, you know, it's been really, you know, um, enlightening. Enlightening. <laughs> great, great work. Thank you. Um, and it's really got me thinking about how young women's potential in school is is potentially being, you know, stifled by this kind of behaviour. Um, and also that their trust in action being taken when they experience it is being damaged at an early age before they go out into adult life. And, you know, how would they then feel about reporting incidences to the police or, or that when they're older. So it's, it sets a really bad tone. Um, I think you've also clearly demonstrated how important it is to consider the diversity of the women that we are engaging through this work and making sure that the solutions really address the, all of the issues that affect young women um, with different identities um, and also the difficulty in, in accessing help for rural women and the, the different level of, you know, potential, you know, confidentiality, confidentiality issues there. So it's, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Thank you to our panel and thank you to everyone who has taken part today. It's been uh, really interesting and I, for one, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing all the additional information that will come through in the reports. The committee has a lot to discuss about how to put that report together. And our next and final meeting will take place on 18th of May. And at that point, we'll be taking some evidence from Scottish government officials um, and agree that final report. So I don't have a little gavel, but the meeting is closed.